101.5 FM proudly presents the Community Kitchen with Annette Long. And welcome to Community Kitchen. Easter's almost upon us, I can't believe it. We spoke about chocolate two weeks ago. Wasn't here last week, babysitting duties. But um, I'm going to share later that uh, peppermint slice uh, recipe that I was talking about with the SBS Feast Mag with um, Alex Clark, who's the editor. And of course, as I said, they sample, they cook, they do all of these things, so it's a worker. So we'll be giving that recipe out a little bit later because uh, I think that's just fantastic. Reminds us of those beautiful um, peppermint slice biscuits that we used to have. And, and I really don't think you have to worry about the Easter egg too much if you've made something special. Today we're going to be talking to parents' jury, and we've talked to them before, and they just a wonderful group and you can join up and and uh, I'm sure Karina will go through that with you later but I think the school canteens and there's lots of different issues they have the um, fame and shame awards which um, really bring to light some of the terrible issues that parents have to contend with when they're going supermarket shopping or um, there's lots of pester power and things like that. You know what it's like when you've got children and they want something. They really do pester you to death and eventually you give in. So we'll talk to Karina a little bit later. And we're going to be talking to Louise Fulton Keats and uh, Practical Parenting. She's talking about how to get your children to the kitchen. And I know that can be a pain when you're doing something and all they want to do is make a mess and eat it and stick their fingers in there. But it's a great introduction of um, for children to get involved with food, which then solves that problem of dinner times because one of the lovely things is uh, is for a child to be involved and have a little bit of ownership of what's going on the plate and you'll be really surprised what uh, you can introduce into their diet. So that's uh, something to look forward to. So what we might do is we might go to our song and we'll come back and we'll talk to Karina from Parents' Jury. You're listening to Our Community Kitchen with Annette Long. And you're back with Community Kitchen. <clears throat> I thought I might start by just giving off the uh, ingredients for the slice. I know that a lot of people... Um, don't always have a pen and paper handy but we're going to go with the um, Australia's Choice for Chocolate and we start off with 100 grams of unsalted butter, always put your stuff at room temperature, it makes it so much easier 110 grams of caster sugar which is half a cup 1 egg, a teaspoon of vanilla extract, 1 cup of plain flour, a third of a cup of cocoa powder I usually find the um, there's a couple of different brands, um, uh, Bronia or oh, I, can't, I can't actually remember the one I use. But anyway, cocoa powder is good, one third of a cup, and 300 grams of dark chocolate. For your peppermint fondant, you'll need one egg white, light, lightly whisked, and uh, two and three quarter cups of pure icing sugar sifted. Important you sift it, otherwise you will get those lumps, and a teaspoon of peppermint essence. So um, starting on that, once again, 100 grams of unsalted butter, uh, half a cup of caster sugar, one egg, one teaspoon of vanilla extract, one cup of plain flour, one third of a cup of cocoa powder and 300 grams of dark chocolate and you will be melting that. For your peppermint fondant, one egg white, lightly whisked, 440 grams, which is two and three quarter cups of pure icing sugar and one teaspoon of peppermint essence. Putting the butter and the sugar in a bowl, stir and con uh, till combined, add your egg and vanilla. Give that a good stir. You don't want lots of uh, lumpy bits of sugar in there. Um, and stir the egg and vanilla into that also till combined. Sift your flour and cocoa into the bowl. Uh, add your butter mis uh, mixture and mix on a low speed until a soft dough forms. You're making a biscuit, so shape into a disc and uh, roll out between two sheets of baking paper about five millimeter thick chill for 15 minutes to firm you're cooking at 180 degrees um, so you'll cut your rounds out and if you can just remember your biscuits what they look like you're just cutting out a round and um, and then you're you're baking them for 15 minutes cool on trays um, and then you can start to actually do your fondant 
and place these. Now, as I said before, if you don't want to make individual ones, you could just make a, um, a tray of slice, which would be just as good. Making your fondant, place your egg white in a bowl, gradually add your sugar and stir with a fork until thick. Stir in the peppermint essence. Roll one and a half teaspoons of mixture into a ball and you'll make the 30 balls and you put the ball on top of the biscuit when it's cooked and gently press down until it covers the whole base. Um, you're melting your chocolate now because you're going to dip this biscuit into your chocolate. Um, so you're melting it. Remember, don't let your water um, touch the bottom of the bowl, otherwise it will actually mess with the chocolate. Um, so using a fork, lower your biscuits into the chocolate to coat and uh, shake off. Now this can be easily done if you just set yourself up with a piece of baking paper and, um, and put a tray, a cooling tray, put your biscuits on top. You could even actually just pour that over the top of it, which um, would be quite good too, doing it either way. I just thought that if you're going to be making a lot... Press it all out, cook it as, a, as one great big tray and then put your fondant on top and chop it after. The only thing you can have problems with, of course, is that your brisket um, base can crumble and crack. But does it really matter? I think it's going to look good. It's going to look fantastic. If you make the individual ones, I was just thinking before, um, if you're making a gift or something like that, and once you put the uh, chocolate on top of it, you can always just put a little Easter egg on the top of each one. Then it looks a little bit Christmas. Um, sorry, Christmassy. A little bit East, uh, Eastery, and you feel as if you made a contribution. So we'll do, we'll I'll come back and give you those ingredients later. But basically, you're just making a biscuit. You're making a fondant, and you're dipping that formed um, biscuit and fondant into the chocolate, and uh, to make the fantastic classic uh, Arnott's mint slice biscuit. But Fancy coming from your kitchen. How good is that? We'll come back shortly. We'll be right back with more from the Community Kitchen. And you're back with Community Kitchen. We have our guest online, Karina from the Parents' Jury. Good morning. Good morning. How are you? Well, how are you? Getting all ready for the Easter weekend? We are indeed, we are indeed, um, and we've had some, some great tips actually just put up on our website from, uh, from a mum who's uh, got a toddler. Yes. Um, and she was uh, having a bit of a think about how to make Easter a bit more healthy and fun, and uh, she's, she's put up some great suggestions. That's good, so people can access that. Yes, yes, they can visit us on uh, parentsjury.org.au. You're very active, and I've spoken to you before. I think it's a great uh, way for parents to be able to have their viewpoint. Yes. Um, there's many issues, aren't there, that sort mm -hmm. of we're faced with. In the last month, we've talked to so many different people with different programs, whether it be government, whether it be private, uh, talking about children's obesity, talking about healthy food. We're talking about tuck shops. We're talking about everything. When it comes down to it, Bart, it's, it's a big job for parents, isn't it? It, it is, and when we talk about the issues to do with childhood obesity, um, I, I mean, I think as you've pointed out, there are a lot of programs and services out there which suggest that it's, you know, it's not something that can just be solved overnight, mm. um, and it's also not something that can just be solved by parents. Um, you know, quite often uh, I hear the, well, it's a parent's responsibility, and yes, absolutely it is, but parents... Uh, can't solve the issues alone you know you need a supportive healthy environment so we quite often talk about the role of you know of industry of government of schools um, of communities and of parents and everybody has a role to play now with the um, we're, we're next uh, actually after the holidays we're going to be talking to the uh, Canteen Association of mm -hmm. Queensland and we're going to yep. be talking to a local school who has taken on a really wonderful healthy initiative in their in their primary school and the kids are loving it um, and I think also that there's so many different things like physical for example the physical exercise of things and one of the things I saw on your website there is that it's recommended for five to eighteen year olds that they have 60 minutes per day and that's minimum exercise yep are those children, are government guidelines yes are, are children getting there um i think uh, members of the parents jury would say that they try very very hard um i think it's a challenge for parents uh, and it's a bigger issue than just making sure that that, that they get activity at school and and 
obviously um, walking to and from school is a good idea and you know after school activities are a great idea um, but there are bigger issues too around you know the suburbs that you live in and how how well they've been planned for families if you've got access to parks if you've got access to walkways you know if you've got access to an environment that encourages physical activity and then of course uh, uh, another big issue is the um, tackling of sedentary behavior there's no denying with you know technology being the way that it is that children uh, and young people are accessing technology in, in greater droves than ever before in fact I think it's something like 90% of children in Australia, if not more, um, regularly use the internet. Mm. Um, so you've got, you know, you've got this whole world in your computer that's very difficult to, to tear a child away from. Um, and with the with our lives being the way they are, it can be an ongoing challenge um, to to increase physical activity, particularly if the environment around you is not conducive. You only have to look at our sports. I mean, adults mm. love sports on the telly, and I'm sure while they're sitting there, they're imagining that they're putting that effort into there, so they actually feel as if they're doing something physical. Mm. Most of the time they're eating and drinking while mm. they're doing that, which absolutely just you know, throws everything out the window. So it is a tricky one for the parents to actually do that. It is, and it's also tricky for those parents who, who want to who want their kids to do something in the community, who want their kids to be active and then who find themselves completely undermined by the, you know, the level of junk food sponsorship that mm. exists in, in kids' sports. You know, how many kids' games and activities do you attend these days where the prizes are vouchers to McDonald's or, you know, or, or something along those lines? And, you know, industry targets children in those ways, um, which really undermines the, the healthy sport, healthy living message and, you know, creates this association between sports and junk food in, in kids' minds. And that's something that parents need to tackle on top of the increased levels of physical activity and tackling sedentary behaviour. I love your food detectives part of, <laughs> your, of your show. And, and, you know, for people who haven't seen it, you go onto this website and they've got some great issues there. Um, I don't know how you're funded or, uh, you know, how the organisation runs. Yeah, so we're a not-for-profit. We're funded by Cancer Council Australia yep. and uh, Diabetes Australia Victoria and uh, YMCA and Vic Health. Uh, and we are free to join yes. um, and you just need to go onto our website and, and sign up. We've got loads of resources on campaigning um, at your school, so campaigning for healthier schools. Plus we, um, you know, we do um, national campaigns. You know, we call out industry when we think that they're unfairly marketing to children. We've just completed um, research on the healthy levels of school canteens. Um, and we are currently working um, with governments around the country on um, on you know, where we're lobbying them to improve the school menus, mm. uh, and we're working with interested parents on developing a manifesto for the federal election this year. That should be good. Now, just yeah. digressing, this food detective, it's interesting. Yes. My children have grown. I haven't had to deal with all these different packages. And it, do you know what? As soon as the ad for that LCM or whatever bar yeah. or whatever <laughs> comes on, I yeah. know what that is. Yeah. And I've never bought it. I've never, ever had to be harassed by it by, with children. Isn't that interesting that the marketing yeah. is just so huge with something yeah. like that yeah no, then it um, leads to pester power <laughs> it, yes and pester power is, is ongoing and and of course the the age-old well parents just need to tackle pester power which of course you do but there's no denying that the environment makes it quite difficult for parents to, to do that successfully uh, all the time and that's you know some of the things that we have got on our site is about tips for tackling pester power but also how you can use your voice to protest mm -hmm. um, against the the environment around you um the Food Detectives is, uh, is, uh, is an interesting project we ran a few years ago, but one of the things that came out of that, which you can also get on our website, is a free guide on how to read uh, a package, how to read the nutrition criteria on processed food. So um, we've done it in terms of traffic light labelling, so you can see whether or not a product, you can use the guide to see whether or not a product is you know, green, amber or red, so whether or not you can eat it all the time, whether or not it should be an occasional treat or whether or not it shouldn't really be part of your diet.
I think that's one thing we've covered in the last couple of months here is the complexity of labelling, and I think mm-hmm. that that is Very something. Much so. It is, and and we were talking to someone just recently, and uh, Lucy, who panels for me, was able to actually go and do one of the scans that this particular one was talking about. Seriously, if I had to shop like that, we would just be having one apple because it's just so complex and it mm. takes so much time. Absolutely. So, you know, I think that when you're talking about lobbying things like that, it'd be great if we could actually have a more simplistic um, view on this because it would make it easier for everybody. Absolutely, and there are, you know, the public health body, uh, ourselves, um, organisations like the Obesity Policy Coalition, um, the Australian Medical Association, the Heart Foundation, yeah, a lot of people are involved in lobbying for things like front of pack, traffic light labelling, um, but industry is not a fan. Uh, industry doesn't want it introduced, no. and so it's been a... a it's been an ongoing battle, but certainly as far as members of the parents' jury are concerned, they're very, very supportive of a front of pack traffic light labelling. I system. think it's I think it's interesting how you see things. I mean, just going through the internet, and I mean, we talk, you were talking about the internet before. I love it because it's such a good thing for a resource for me. And I noticed that Michelle Obama has actually yes. got this program, Let's Move. Let's Move, yeah. And it's wonderful because, you know, when you start to see people of position, um, and as she says on her website that, you know, she is a mum, foremost, and uh, she's had to, to really look at this healthy, affordable, which I love that mm-hmm. word, a healthy, affordable food. Um, you don't want to have to pay a fortune for something that you want to give your children every day. But they've brought this great thing now, the Sesame Street Big Bird, into it because, Mm -hmm. you know, let's face it, sometimes you have to use those things to actually get something across. So it is nice to see that these things are happening throughout the world and uh, with you guys lobbying, uh, you know, maybe we've got a chance somewhere, (laughs) Karina. So I think that there are a lot of, um, you know, there's a growing voice out there in the um, uh, in the public health arena, and of course there's nothing to stop any interested person, parent. Um, obviously they can join us and tell us the issues that bother them, and we can help them campaign. But you can also hop on change.org um, and start your own petition for things that bother you. Um, and, and you know, there's there's a great there's great avenues as you point out. The internet and social media are great opportunities for for people to get out there and, and really make their voice heard. I think it's wonderful. And uh, what's in the pipeline for you guys? What else are you getting your teeth into? Uh, so well, we're we're in the middle of our school canteens. Um, work. So we had research released last week that showed that um, aside from Western Australia, most states and territories in Australia don't uh, comply with their, their nutrition guidelines. So um, we're trying to do some work around encouraging um, governments to, uh, to encourage their schools to work with some great support services like the Queensland Association for school tuck shops and like Nutrition Australia Queensland um, to, to help schools improve their menus. We're starting our planning for um, the Federal Election Manifesto for getting the parent voice out there. Uh, and of course we're um, always looking for examples of marketing to children um, for our annual Fame and Shame Awards that happened later this year where we, we rely on parents to tell us about examples of advertising that they feel Uh, is targeting their children and we call out industry on it Um, and in the world of digital marketing that's a growing issue. I think it's fantastic. Good luck. Thank you very much. And very nice to talk to you once again. Not a problem. Thank you very much. Bye Karina. Bye. And uh, we've been talking to Karina from the Parents' Jury. And as she said, not-for-profit, go online, have a look. It's fantastic for some of those things that uh, parents, I'm sure, need to have a fight about with their kids. Maybe it's the answer to get on there and have a little look at at other people deal with this thing, the pester powering. The um, I love the Fame and Shame Awards. I think they're such a wonderful thing because there are some wonderful products out there. We don't want to be all negative on this show, but there are some wonderful products that we should acknowledge, and there's some dreadful ones that we should uh, always remember when we're shopping. Uh, I think we might get a song and we'll come back with our next guest. And we're back again. I really enjoy talking to uh, Karina and we've had her on our show with the parents' duty, the jury. Um, I I just think it's one of those great things and and, uh, after we come back from Easter, actually no, the radio station is getting some repairs done next week so we won't be around. But the week after that, um, I will be talking to the... um, 
uh, Queensland Association for uh, School Tuck Shops and also wonderful um, uh, PNC got together at Narangba State School and they're doing some fantastic things in their... Um, for their lunches for their children apparently the response is just fantastic just following up a, an article I read in the paper last week and I think it's great to see uh, to see these things happening and of course sometimes you're going to have different kids who won't like it but seriously they'll get used to it after a while and I think it's very important and after you talk to Karina she was saying that um, there's there's really starting to lobby now for this because we've got uh, let's face it we've got a lot of problems out there with children at the moment and when you you think about the guidelines being, the uh, government guidelines being 60 minutes of play per day, I'd wonder whether there's many children. And that's classed as huff-puff play, so you have to have a little bit of energy into that. A lot of children don't have the time. It's, you know, working and parents working. It is a very difficult thing for children, but I guess the one thing that can happen is when they go to school, they've got some decent canteen food. I think we'll just go to our song, then we'll come back with our next guest. And we're back with Community Kitchen. We have our guest online. Uh, good morning, Louise. Hello. How are you? Very well. Thank now, you're you. a food writer with a passion for children's food and nutrition. I sure am. I, um, I was lucky enough to grow up with uh, Margaret Fulton as a grandma and a, a mum who's also a food writer. So I've always been in a wonderful world of food and always had a passion for food. But thankfully, I now do it as a career as well, so I feel very privileged. Oh, you must have been privileged to be in Margaret Fulton's kitchen. <laughs> I, I, I certainly was, and my uh, my mum and dad live in the same street as Grandma, and so I could toddle off down the road <laughs> and climb through her jog door and plonk myself down at her kitchen table whenever I pleased. Isn't and, it? Uh, it's a beautiful memory, isn't it? Very, and... Uh, she still lives in the same house, and my mum and dad do too, so I still see plenty of her, which is wonderful. But she really did... I, I, I left home feeling like, oh, I don't know if I'm a very good cook, or I don't know if I... You know, I'm not, I certainly couldn't cook like they could, but I, I went along to court on birth soon after leaving home, and I realised that I had picked up so much from mm. being growing up in that household, although I didn't have necessarily formal schools from a from a formal formal skills from a court on blur type level i realized that i almost did just from having watched them make a recipe so many times even now of course i use cookbooks but i feel like i sort of carry around a visual encyclopedia when i go to make something i usually just stop and think oh i'm sure i've seen mum make this before i'm sure i've seen grandma make this before and that's one reason i think it's so important to include kids in the kitchen because they just pick up so much without you as a parent even realising it. And that's what this interview is all about. And just for our mm. listeners, I, I saw this great article about having fun in the kitchen and enjoying family meal times. And, and this yeah. can be a drama, can't it? Oh, look, it can. It's hard with children. I've got a little three-year-old boy myself, so I do recognise how difficult it is to um, sustain an interest, particularly for young kids in cooking. But I think... I think if you can have the patience to involve them, and there's research that supports this, they really are more inclined to be interested in the food you eat and, and in more adventurous types of dishes than if you're not allowed in the kitchen. And it's really hard on a day-to-day -day level to, to practice what I preach because sure. we all know all you want to do is kind of shoo them out and just get the job done while the TV's on. But on those days that you can manage it you just um i think it's the greatest life skill to leave home knowing a few basic dishes one thing i recommend for people with slightly older children is to start encouraging them to know a signature dish mm. so my dishes were different from my sisters and we um we, we mum and dad and my grandma encouraged that in us and uh, what I suggest to readers is that they make this dish however many times it takes until their child knows it by heart and can confidently make it on their own. Obviously, this is for a slightly older child. Um, and then if they can leave home with a repertoire of even just half a dozen dishes, they'll have such confidence in the kitchen. They'll leave home thinking, 
oh, I might not be a brilliant cook, but I'm a competent cook and mm. I can cook a meal for myself and I can cook a meal for a girlfriend and yeah, it's um it's just the best life skill I think for leaving home and it gives it gives children just it, it's a self esteem booster. And it also and I talk about this in, in the article which you would have seen in Practical Parenting magazine, it gives children some um science and math basics as well. So any any basic baking involves understanding fractions and measurements and timing and all that sort of thing. So it does. I, I, I've got a friend who's a maths tutor, and she does a lot of her tutoring in the kitchen because it's a really hands-on way to learn about maths and chemistry. Mm. I think I love the idea of this signature dish because it, it you know it does make your child, and, and it's even good for people when I say that some, you know we're talking about entertaining or something, and I mm. said. Don't cruel yourself by making something complicated. People enjoy just sitting around and enjoying food together. You're better off doing something that you're familiar with, you're not harassed. It doesn't have to be a five-course gourmet meal. It can be a one-dish wonder, and, um, and you can enjoy it. I think the Europeans do that well. I was in Germany a couple of years ago, and we are invited into relative strangers' house for dinner, and for dinner this woman served an enormous platter of asparagus, yeah. a beautiful quality prosciutto and a good cheese. And that's all we had for dinner. It was one of the most delicious meals I've ever had. And then a, a, a big bowl of fruit for, for dessert. Something like that, just a big generous serving of something like that can be the best meal you have. And I think that my grandma's cooking has always been about that. She just uses the best ingredients and mm. does them well. But she'll make the best chicken soup you've ever tasted or the best roast dinner that's doesn't necessarily have a lot of elements to it, but it's just good produce that's not been sort of messed with. Uh, but I absolutely agree for entertaining. I think that lots of people get very frazzled because they try and take on too much. Now, when you're talking about you, you know getting little children into the um, into the kitchen, I read an interesting article on the weekend that was saying that that uh, children, like breast milk, actually apparently tastes mm. like vanilla milk. Mm. Therefore, children like a sweeter food, and they were talking about combining fruit in with the vegetables and slowly introducing because you had a little bit of sweetness. Because children do actually like sweeter food, don't they? I'm so glad you've asked me this question because it's a very very particular research interest of mine. We now know that breast milk does taste like whatever foods and drinks mum has. Mm. And what's most interesting is so does amniotic fluid. So you think about a baby's taste preferences and how they develop. It starts in the womb. Mm. There are studies that show that babies whose mothers ate a lot of carrots and carrot juice during pregnancy have a, have a greater preference for carrots flavoured cereal once they're starting solids. The same is true of breastfeeding babies. So mums who are pregnant or breastfeeding, you can already start to teach your child a preference for certain flavours by eating them yourself. So if you want your child to eat her broccoli, <laughs> eat it yourself while you're pregnant and while you're breastfeeding. And there is evidence that it lends a lot of support to this. It's one benefit of breastfeeding because every meal tastes different. So formula milk, the meal will taste the same every feed, but with breast milk, depending on what you've had, it will be enormous variety and you're already teaching your child. It's, it's, our, it's nature's way of teaching children what's safe to eat and what's good to eat when they venture off and start eating for themselves. It is, it is sweet and children are born, children are born with a preference for sweet and an aversion to bitter, but they can overcome this. Just think how most of us, like a, like a drink of coffee that's something that we've learned most of our taste preferences are nurture not nature so we learn to like different foods and you can do that and you can teach your child that by just simply exposing them to it so I always say to parents they want to give their children sweetened yogurt or fruit flavored yogurt because that's what they prefer eating I always say give them a chance with the plain yogurt because you never know they may love it my mm. son does even though I don't particularly like it myself so yes, putting a bit of fruit in with the vegetable puree is absolutely fine, but also give them a chance to learn to like the vegetable puree on its own. If ever they're going to be open to it, it's in those early um, months of starting solids. So give them some pea puree, give them some broccoli puree. Don't assume that everything needs to be sweetened. Give them a chance to learn to like bitter, which they never will if you don't expose them to it. 
I think it's interesting also, a lot of parents you talk to, they say that if they've got a little veggie garden, kids will just go and eat the vegetables off the, out of the garden. And yet if you put a plate of beans down in front of a child, sometimes they're just sort of a bit reluctant about it, but yet they'll just go and eat them raw. And a lot of people feel if they give their children a plate of raw vegetables, they're not going to, win, you know, it's not a good thing, but it's, it's beautiful nutrition for them. Oh, it's wonderful. There is a lot of research that supports the idea that involving children in gardening and involving them in cooking increases their vegetable variety, increases the uh, variety of vegetables they consume. As parents, we also have to be good role models. There's also um, studies that suggest that the more vegetables mum eats in particular, dad's important too, but mum's very important usually because she's more, does more of the parenting. The more vegetables mum eats, the more the child will eat. But we've got a little next door neighbour, she's about eight and she wouldn't touch any herbs or specks of green in her food. And um, and we built her a little herb garden and now she loves it. And she oh, really? it because she understands where it comes from and she has this pride in growing it. And so she, what it does is that familiarity um, knocks down the phobia that children have around food. And it's, it is a phobia and it comes from being unfamiliar. So I always encourage parents to make their children familiar with different foods on lots of different levels. It doesn't just mean putting um, a peach puree in front of them. It means when they're babies, let them touch the fuzzy skin, let them mm. hold a whole piece of peach. When you're at the supermarket, point out the peach. My little boy not so long ago didn't want to eat any plum and then I reminded him that the hungry caterpillar ate three of them and then he was willing to have a go. So it's that kind of holistic approach to to food and, and not just putting it on a plate, but it's that, that, that food education across the board really helps to break down those phobic barriers that children develop. I think it's also sad a lot of the times that nowadays, and you know, we talk about busy and, and with all these things, but the family table seems to have got smaller, hasn't it? It has, and it's hard because, like you say, people are so busy. It can be very hard in many households to just even time a meal where everyone sits down together. But in that article that's in this month's Practical Parenting, I do talk about the benefits of a family meal. And there's studies that show that children who eat as a family are actually less likely to um, become alcoholics or to become, you know, to, to suffer from drug abuse or alcohol abuse. And, and I think it's, and they're also more likely to say that their parents know what's going on in their lives. Children mm. who don't sit, teenagers who don't sit down for a family meal, uh, when asked the question, do your mum and dad really know what's going on in your life, they were the ones who were most likely to say no. So um, I, I, it's always been a part of my family life that we sat down and spoke about what was going on in the day. But it is really hard. And what I say to people is, if you can't do it every night, that's fine. Just do it when you can and try and switch the television off. Because if the TV's on, no matter um, how hard you're trying to concentrate on the person next to you, it's, you sort of just seem to be drawn to it. But it is, a, it is an ideal time to sit down and try and catch up on each other's news and it, it can be hard but well worth the effort. I think it's amazing, isn't it, that we talk nowadays of being just so busy. You wonder what keeps us all so busy when once upon a time, you know, our parents and your grandparents, and mm. they didn't even have a washing machine. Now, that was busy because they had to get out there and boil and they had to do everything by hand. And yet yeah. we're so automated now and yet we just seem to have got busy ridiculously busy. I think it's keeping up with the Joneses. We all need to support our <laughs> consumer's lifestyle, but um, it's hard. I mean, I'm, I'm guilty as anyone else. Um, I'm actually at a photo shoot as we speak, about to shoot another uh, book, but it's just, uh, yes, you know, trying to fit food instead. I was saying to a friend of mine on the weekend who has four children, food takes up an awful lot of our time. She said, tell me about it. She said, I have to cook five meals a day for six people, you know, when you include morning and afternoon tea mm. but I feel like it's all I ever do and it's I, I was trying to encourage her because she's not much of a cook to learn some efficiency in the kitchen so I said mm. if you're going to make a dinner try and make it two dinners if you're going to make a cottage pie make a second one and pop it in the fridge for tomorrow night or the freezer for next week uh, if you're making a pot of ratatouille make a double quantity so that you've got some left over for the next night it's about if you're going to make the effort to cook and uh, I think you know there's lots of Italian and Greek families who've mastered this well and mm, truly, but definitely. it's about trying to make your cooking as efficient as possible so that you can um, enjoy it for, you know, the subsequent couple of days rather than go to all that effort and just have one meal from it. 
Um, yeah. So we're about to head into Christ into Easter holidays here, so mm. maybe we can have some of our parents have a little bit of fun in the kitchen. I think the one point you made here was, you know, just ignore the mess. Ignore, yeah. ignore that for a while. Set up one little task and let that happen. What I find is if you try, and it's like when a kid does a school project, if you want it to be perfect, you're all going to end up in tears. Mm -hmm. What I find works really well is rather than take over demonstrating your, with your son or daughter, ha let them have their own set up and you have your own set up. So if you're making a, um, I'm just making a batch of jam thumbprint cookies. If you're making a batch of those and you want some to look beautiful, then ha make your own, but have their little bench next to you where they can be, you know, making lots of mistakes and no one's too precious about it. It's really hard because if we're going to the effort to shop for ingredients and cook something beautiful, we want it to turn out well. Um, but if you can just sort of spare some of the ingredients and allow them to make a mess. My own mum and grandma were so patient with me. I didn't realise until I became a mum. Yes. But I realise now how patient they were with me. And I really think it's such a, um, such a gift mm. to give a child that patience. My granddad talks about my little boy and he says, oh, I'm going to spoil him rotten. I'm going to spoil him with my time. And I think if you can spoil a child with your time and your patience, um, it's the, the, the benefits will be so evident because um, it's really what, really what kids need. And it, look, I'm definitely not perfect. There are lots of occasions when I just need to have my kitchen to myself. <laughs> So I think the good thing is to focus on the on the journey rather than the outcome. It doesn't really matter what the outcome is. It's all about the process. And so long as they've had fun through it, then mission accomplished. I think that's um, wonderful. Not take it all too seriously. <laughs> well, I'll let you get back to your photo shoot. Good luck <laughs> thank with your you. next book. And thank, thank you very so much. much. My pleasure. Have a great Easter. Bye now. Bye. And we've been talking to uh, Louise Fulton Keats, and uh, she's a passionate food writer and, and uh, loves loves getting children involved in the kitchen. So um, that's almost our pre-Easter special coming up. And of course, get in there, as she said, and have a bit of a go. And uh, if your children um, are cooking with you, and if you are a bit of a perfectionist, make make a little batch aside. I know that we made some uh, biscuits up at the farm just recently. I had the grandsons there and f making the little fork print sometimes was like a squash diminished biscuit across the bench. But um, you get there after a while and uh, I must say that they're usually not the ones that they eat. They usually go <laughs> for the other ones. So maybe let them uh, have their own little fun and um, and enjoy it. It's really, at the end of the day, it's only a very small thing. But the pleasure of doing it is uh, is very nice. Children seem to love that. And I think it's nice to encourage the um, the time spent in the kitchen as a positive thing rather than negative. Well, that's uh, it for me. And we'll be back, uh, not next week, of course, because we're having renovations done at the studio. We'll be back the week after, which will be the 9th. So have a safe Easter and uh, do some cooking. We'll talk to you later.